All right. Well, uh, while people file into the room here, I always like to ask a really goofy question that has nothing to do with the subject matter. And um, so since it is the since we're in a new year, this maybe this one won't be so goofy. What's uh, what's what's your best goal, Matthew? What's your biggest goal that you've got planned? Oh, my biggest goal. Uh, yeah. After um, meeting Anthony uh, in person, my my goal is to achieve his body fat percentage um, rate. So he's he's much taller than me and very lean, and he uh, he outweighs me by probably like. 30 or 40 pounds, but uh, he probably has a body fat percentage about 5% lower than me. So the, oh, wow. my, my goal is going to be to go from the body fat. I've been working on it. So I get my body fat percent under this guy. So I can, uh, next time we're in person together, I look like, like, a. <laughs> yeah. Now, have you done like the tank test or anything like that to, to get the, like, the... no, I do the one, uh, there's a machine at my doctor's office and you hold okay. the thing. So I've, I'm about a year into the journey down 6% body fat. So I'm Great. working. So that's awesome. Close to my goal. And then right, I met Anthony and it moved my goal. So. There you go. Anthony, do you have one? Yeah. So I do, I do CrossFit um, every day, me and my wife and the, the kiddos go to CrossFit. So my goal this year is to master um, bar muscle ups, which is the crazy thing. You always see everybody do where they go up and push up on the, the bar. That's, that's my goal for this year. So I go, I go once a week to get extra uh, support to learn how to do that. Because as Matthew pointed out, um, being six foot five and weighing 240 pounds, it is not easy to do gymnastics. Um, I guess not. <laughs> so that's my, that's my big overarching goal for this year. Yeah. I want my arms to look like his when I go like that. So I'm like, <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's two strong goals. Well, well, good luck to both of you. All right. So my name is Gary D. Hart. And I do want to say thanks to everybody for joining us for today's webinar, Crypto 101 for Accountants and Bookkeeper. I am the publisher and managing partner of Insightful Accountant and Tax Practice News. I do want to say thanks to our presenters, both Matthew May and Anthony Zapata, both from Acuity Accounting. Matthew is the founder and CEO of, of Acuity Accounting, and Anthony is a crypto controller practice lead. I think I got that right. It's close and enough. Yeah, close enough. All right. Give me some uh, plus or minus, right? Um, and I also like to say thank you to our sponsor, Zero, which I don't even know if we have Zero plastered throughout the slide deck or not. But I will uh, plaster them through the slide deck. I'll go type that in real quick. Yeah. So, so without their support, uh, this webinar wouldn't be happening. So thank you, Zero. And there will be a polling question towards the end where uh, we're going to ask you if you'd like to hear from them. And we hope you yes. So, a couple of housekeeping items before I turn this over. Uh, CPE is available for this session, just like any other CPE uh, requirements. You have to be engaged in this session for 50 minutes, five, zero minutes. We'll have three polling questions. You're going to need to answer all three of those polling questions. If you meet those two requirements, 50 minutes and answer three poll questions, we will send you a, um, an email with a link to a survey. Complete that survey. The is about the webinar. Complete that survey and we will email you the certificate to the email address that you signed up, that you used for, uh, for this webinar. If you have any questions, we're going to ask you to put them in the questions panel and the link to the recording will be sent to you and can be found on our YouTube channel, which I will also put that link, the YouTube channel link into the chat, uh, but the link will be sent to you along with the slide deck. And once I turn this over to uh, Matthew and Anthony, I'll also post the slide deck into chat. So uh, if you come in late and you don't see it, well, you wouldn't hear, hear me say this anyway, but just let me know and I can repost it later. So slides, as I said, they will be available. So really without any further delay, I'll let these two men come in and uh, tell us all they know about crypto, which I am uh, looking forward to learning some things here. So gentlemen, thank you. We promise not to tell you everything we know about crypto. <laughs> All right. Tell you know, us most of what you know. We will probably, so we, 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 we tried to put it into a digestible format and talk about the things that have just happened this year. Uh, like he said, my name is Matthew May. I'm one of the founders of Acuity. He promoted me to CEO. Uh, I'm our president. Um, but, uh, and uh, Anthony runs our cryptocurrency practice. I've been in cryptocurrency since 2017 when one of our clients came to us and said, hey, there's this thing called a token sale. Uh, we did it. We have 
$30 million now and we have uh, another $150 million in the bank and we need your help. And so we kind of fumbled through uh, how to do the accounting and, and all that kind of stuff and fast forward uh, several years and, and we're here with a, a crypto practice that, that Anthony runs. Anthony, you want to introduce yourself too or did I do okay? No, you did good. But um, yeah, my name is Anthony Zapata. I'm the crypto practice lead here at Acuity. Um, excited to help teach everybody about crypto. I have been in crypto on and off, kind of in and out for, I don't know, the last four or five years. Um, two years ago, I was at a different consulting practice where I had a client um, come in and say, hey, we're about to fundraise uh, about $90 million and we need your help getting the books caught up because um, it was a complete mess. They had done everything uh, basically half their business was in crypto and uh, the previous accountant had no idea. So we had to go in and figure that out, put it into a really nice, easy format so that we could take it to coincidentally one of the big four um, to help them through that fundraise. So I cut my teeth going through five or 6,000 transactions, learning crypto in a crash course all at once. So that's me and uh, excited to be here with Matthew. Yeah, and Zero's asked us to come here and uh, prep uh, our kind of uh, what's new in crypto this year. We focus mostly on 2022 and the stuff going on. Uh, so we'll take you through that. And um, like they said, there's a QA and a uh, you can ask. Uh, but uh, we wanted to start with what was in the news last year. This is We start with this section because that's typically what our clients ask us uh, and uh, what you need to be prepped on uh, for the things coming in. If you're a tax person going to tax season, if you're accountant, uh, trying to figure out what your end reports are going to look like. But um, as many of you know that are in this space, it wasn't really good uh, from a from a uh, news perspective for folks. Uh, and uh, we had, in particular, about four bankruptcies uh, that went down. The most notable one is one called FTX, but there's some other ones that went down called Voyager, Celsius, and BlockFi. Uh, though, um, there's probably going to be a movie about FTX. It's been in the news so much lately. Uh, so that's kind of uh, uh, something that you should be aware of. Uh, we'll talk about some of the ramifications of that and how you should plan for that uh, in a second. But basically, what we wanted to step back and say, um, our, what our clients are struggling with is this concept of what, um, what these counterparties are that they're working with are. Um, we have these counterparties called exchanges. You've heard of uh, ones in the US that are the most notable are ones called Coinbase and Gemini. Um, FTX was in that category. And then uh, internationally, there's one called Binance. Um, those tend to be the three largest exchanges we see. But people have mistaken them as banks. They, they assume that there's something like FDIC insurance. Um, but there are exchanges. And just like their name, they're, they have a purpose built uh, uh, mechanism and they are for exchanging uh, one kind of crypto for another or one kind of crypto uh, to US dollars or another kind of fiat currency, another government currency. And this is the, the unfortunate thing about this is this is not the first time this has happened that this confusion is continuing to perpetuate. In 2014, there was uh, a, a, a very high profile exchange that went down called Mt. Gox. And we, we seem to not be learning from our history. So the quote is right. If we don't learn from our history, we're condemned to repeat it. Um, but there was more. Uh, there was more bad news, actually. Um, some of the uh, Luna and Terra earlier in the year were two of the cryptocurrencies. One was a, a, a purported stable coin, and a stable coin is not supposed to fluctuate. And they went down. Uh, that was an algorithmically based stable coin instead of a, a staked stable coin. So there was an algorithm that was supposed to work to keep it balanced out, uh, and it went down. So lots of losses, um, but uh, there's there's a, there's a few things that you need to know when you're talking to your clients about these things that are still consistent um, for this. Is, is, is first of all, exchanges are for exchanging, um, not really custody. They're not really custody solutions. They're not built like banks. So if you have any meaningful amount of money or cryptocurrency, um, there's a one theory is get in, exchange it and get out. And the, the saying in cryptocurrency is not your keys, not your coins. Basically, if you have something at Coinbase or something at Gemini, and as we're seeing something, if you had something at FTX, they were the registered owners of those cryptocurrencies and not you. Um, and now in the bankruptcy proceedings, there's some question as whether the, the customer accounts have first priority 
over other creditors because um, they're businesses and they had overextended. They had used customer funds uh, to uh, customer cryptocurrency to fund um, different different operations. So in order to avoid that, you got to make sure that that um, that that our clients or your clients know um, that if if they don't own the private key, it's not it's not their coins. And um, if they say, "How do you own a private key?" They may not need to be in cryptocurrency and in custody in crypt cryptocurrency because it is a relatively com complex. Um, and then uh, the last thing is 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 we want to talk a little bit about researching and, and knowing what you're buying, and we have a couple of slides on that. Anthony, we have any questions so far? Are we doing okay? We're doing good. No questions so far. All right. We've got a couple of things coming through the chat. If you have questions, make sure to post them in the Q&A. Anthony's going to keep me honest, and we're going to tag team a little bit um, in a second. Um, the, the, the problem I, I, we ha have with uh, cryptocurrency is kind of getting tactical advice for us to use as accountants. Um, so when, we, when Anthony and I were brainstorming, uh, we, we, we thought, well, what is getting used the most uh, currently in our practice? And, and there are three particular stable coins uh, we're seeing. And we wanted to talk a little bit about that because they are also some of the front runners uh, for kind of um, overcoming some of the obstacles, creating more transparency, uh, getting you more comfortable on what's behind them, what's backing the stable coins. Uh, and it's these three, USDT, uh, which some people call Tether, um, USDC, which is USD coin, you, you'll hear it say, and then Binance has a stable coin. Um, Binance uh, is uh, one of the, the largest, um, I think the largest exchange globally. And uh, what, what's happening with all three of these is they've engaged public accounting firms to come in and do agreed upon procedures reporting on different cadences uh, to give people comfort that the that there's actual cash or CDs and or something behind uh, the currency out there. Um, so, uh, just to to give you a visual uh, on how significant these three cryptocurrencies are, we took a snapshot right before year end uh, of some of that. You can see it's a little dated. Bitcoin's up and Ethereum's up since then. But Tether, USDC, and Binance are three of the top cryptocurrencies um, by market cap. They're all pegged to the U.S. dollar, so they should trade at one dollar for one dollar. You'll see, you know, you know, three nines for some of them. But one thing that a lot of people aren't watching is the volume on the right column. Um, over forty billion dollars daily uh, at the time we did the snapshot. Um, was being traded on the stable coins. And if you look at Bitcoin or Ethereum, that's more than Bitcoin and Ethereum combined. So people are seeking out these digital currencies for something other than um, kind of profit or investment. Um, they're actually using these uh, as uh, alternatives to the US dollar, uh, cross-border payments, uh, things of that nature. So that's a significant move or change in cryptocurrencies. Um, that we're going to have to be prepared prepared for as accountants because we're going to have to track those uh, for the people and the for the individuals and the businesses that are using those. Matthew, one of the questions that came across the chat is, uh, what percentage of individuals do you, are dabbling in crypto actually own their keys? Um, that's a great question. I think that's a relatively small percentage, and I'm I'm okay with that. If the amount of the, like, I think they say 70% of people in the United States have cryptocurrency or, or dabbled in cryptocurrency. And I think using the exchanges is fine. I, the personal rule I have for people is like, if it gets to that material amount, most people use $10,000. If you have over $10,000 on an exchange, you start, you, you need to start, you're, you're starting to like have a significant stake for most people um, in that's when you should start exploring like having private keys versus using exchanges. I mean, if it's if it's something nominal to your clients on a materiality perspective, you, the, the risk at most of the exchanges like Coinbase, Binance, and, and Gemini is not nothing, but it's low enough to maybe there's a cost benefit of going to private keys. So 10K for me is the point where we're, if I see somebody that's hosting more than 10K is they need to start being educated on private keys and how to custody and some of the counterparty risks. I don't think we, 
some of the people are just learning about crypto. You know, somebody bought a hundred dollars worth of crypto. Uh, I mean, th there's only so much you, you, they're just learning still, right? They're not, they're not trying to treat it like an investment or other, other way. So I think one of the things to think about is like, just kind of to put it in, put it in a more uh, easy, just easy understanding is like, if you had a hundred thousand dollars worth of gold, would you keep it in a backpack and bring it around with you everywhere? Or would you keep it in a safety deposit box? Right. Yeah. That could be another, another thing to think about when it comes to, you know, keeping it on an exchange, you know, which is probably more secure than a backpack, but I, I don't know, um, compared to, you know, putting it in that safety deposit box. Yeah. And there's, there's some simple devices to, to hold cryptocurrency. Um, one of my favorites, I'm sorry, reaching over is one called the Trezor. The other one's called a Ledger. Uh, these are about 70 bucks each. Um, so it's got to be worth at least 70 bucks uh, to, to, to self-custody, but it's a relatively simple um, device. Uh, but it's not for the, uh, like it requires education, just like anything else in, in holding things. Uh, you read those horror stories about people who had their private keys on their computer and the guy in the UK that has a billion dollars in a dump somewhere. Um, so um, there's definitely cost benefit uh, trade-offs. So um, to demystify or to give you something tactical you can do to help your clients, um, and we're going to use just these three stable coins as an example, um, we're, we're looking to give our clients comfort that they're making good choices or bad choices with the cryptos that they hold. Uh, this is an example of uh, the, the report BDO is issuing on USDT. You can see, you, you, you can... Easy, you can see this is like for accountants, this is our love language, right? So you can see how what they have in T-bills, commercial paper, money market funds. And as it goes down, it gets less liquid, right? So you can have a, 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 a actual discussion with your clients about if they're holding Tether, what that means they're actually holding. Uh, you can also look at the BDO, Agreed Upon Procedures Report. No, it's not an audit. It's not a review. <laughs> it's agreed upon procedures. So any ex-auditors or any current auditors in the room know that, that that comes with a different set of standards and a different set of procedures. You have to read very carefully exactly what the accountant was doing. But these reports are public. And these on these three, they're being issued either quarterly or monthly on each of these cryptocurrencies. Great first step for transparency, if you think about it. For USDC, you can see it's very different, right? They are primarily buying US treasuries. They're not really m messing with any of the other stuff. Tether has a much more diverse portfolio. Grant Thornton is issuing the agreed upon procedures on this one. They're doing it monthly. Um, and you can see, you can actually track the QSIP on the US tre treasuries that are owned um, based on uh, the cash that's come in that backs USDC. Finally, Binance USD, uh, it doesn't have as pretty of a report, but Witham's issuing monthly agreed upon procedures on this one um, to talk about the balances in there um, and, and, and what exactly is behind it. If you were to look at these, I'm sure you would have a preference on a recommendation based on your experience and history just with agreed upon procedures on what you would advise uh, your clients if they're going to be in cryptocurrency to do. So. Um, just wanted to give that context uh, for people because I think stable coins are the cutting edge. So they're the first in creating transparency and what's going on. Uh, and then they're, they're also the easiest to understand uh, and, and, and to explain to our clients. From a 2022 versus 2021 perspective on what you can expect, and this is for the tax people in the room, uh, you can see 2021 was up and down and all over the place, and there were losses and gains and everything to be had. And um, in 2022, it just looks like a down and to the right kind of graph this year, uh, which means if people bought this year, um, they probably, and they sold or transacted, they probably have a bunch of capital losses coming. So there's two main issues that, that kind of arise um, based on the current events. One, because of the downward chart, you're gonna, you might need to be more proactive than normal about helping people plan for the capital loss limitations they might face. So if they don't have a bunch of capital gains other places and based on the stock market, it's unlikely. Um, they're gonna, just like clients do every year in the tax world, they're gonna be expecting one thing and we need to make, help manage their expectations 
uh, through this estimated payment in um, <laughs> the 15th, or I don't know if the 15th is on a weekend this year, but um, on the 15th, and then um, also uh, on the April 15th, um, kind of final final payment for last year. So just having a proactive solution to that is going to help you probably, just like uh, everything else, uh, giving them some advance notice or as much as you can, um, it, it, especially since they probably haven't been communicating to you uh, what they've been doing in crypto. The second issue a lot of people aren't thinking about either, um, with FTX, Celsius, BlockFi, and Voyager, you have a lot of people that think they have losses. And I'm not sure, uh, and I'm not a tax person, I'm not sure the tax people would tell you that it's that clean. These bankruptcies are not settled. There is no certainty on what percentage or if anything, anybody's going to get anything. People might get 20 cents on the dollar. They might get 60 cents on the dollar. They might get 8 cents on the dollar. They might get nothing. But I think all the clients are expecting that they're going to be able to write off everything. So if you're comfortable with that position, I don't think you have anything to do. If you're not comfortable with that position, um, then I would be thinking about what messages you want to send to your client group um, that, that, that could be exposed to this kind of issue. I've been talking too much, Anthony. So do you have any questions? Well, I want you to tell them about NFTs because everybody's been buzzing about NFTs all year. And this is like... I'm like 20 years too old for this. So you gotta you gotta help me out. Can we, hey, can we uh, get a poll question in? Sure. Go ahead. Launch a poll. Oh, everybody, wake up. Gotta do a poll. You gotta get credit, CP. I am sensitive to that. Oh, I hope I get CP too, by the way. Can I? I don't know. Oh, I can I have to probably hit the poll to do that. Oh no. So the poll is, what is your experience with crypto? None, some, I'm all in on crypto. Oh, man, I can't vote. How do I get my CP? Uh, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, we can talk afterwards. I'm just joking. All right, I we'll leave this open. Yeah, we'll leave it open for about uh, five or six more seconds. So if you do need the uh, CPE. Uh, you if, you're, if you have us on the headphones and you're not watching our pretty faces, then jump over, hit the button, and you get your credit. Come on, guys. I'm sure you're going to miss out. So we're going to close it out. Three, two, and one. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So I'm here to talk about NFTs. Oh, as lots of nuns, NFT. Anthony, just so you know. 61% said no experience with crypto. Some, some said some experience with crypto. And 2% said all in all the time for crypto. So Okay. Well, so this this these next couple of slides are for the 2%, not that 60%. Uh, these are, so NFTs, and, and like Matthew said, he's having me uh, talk through it because he doesn't know Jack about NFTs. No, they're, they're interesting. He, he's, he's my go-to for everything. But NFTs are really kind of interesting and different um, technology. They are technology. Um, NFTs stands for non-fungible token. That will go down as the worst acronym of all time. I'm not sure why they came up with that, but they decided to. Um, so non-fungible means that there's not a way to, there is a unique copy of it, um, depending on, uh, uh, numerous amounts of factors, but we'll go into some of those. So what is an NFT? Um, it is digital artwork, um, that is created and hosted on the blockchain. So it is, it, it is tied to code on computers as we kind of see things through. So what we noticed last year in 2022 is companies started to really go all in on um, NFTs in how they were creating them. And then a lot of companies decided to go in and start doing some more um, kind of uh, licensing agreements. As you'll see there at the top, we've got Happy Dad, um, which is a very popular um, seltzer uh, that the uh, that, that some podcasters make. Well, they, they bought one of these NFTs to use the image to license it for their seltzer brand that they put that they put out. So that was one example of NFTs and kind of how it had usability. Um, in the bottom right, we also have uh, Budweiser did a launch of NFTs. I think Kenji actually got one, didn't he, Matthew? Didn't he? Get yeah, one? we did a webinar where we we got one. And um, the interesting thing Bud Light was doing is they were. Um, they had this interesting artwork that you could get, but also they were promising um, the rights to future events, uh, future things. Um, so they were trying to make the next step, right, which we see a lot of people doing, where there will be some right associated with it, which was like 
in this one, it was pretty nominal. It was like the right to get some swag down the road. So whoever's the owner of that NFT in the future would be able to claim swag uh, if they owned it. So the, the value then theoretically uh, is about how much you like swag. Uh, uh, and and the artwork itself, I guess. So, yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's sort of uh, the the digital collective style of things. As we saw last year, a lot of people. Um, I think we've seen in, in the past, I don't know, five years or so, we've seen a lot of influencers um, will go out and you know, uh, oh, who was that guy in the very beginning of, the, of sort of a YouTube ads where he'd be in his He'd be in his uh, garage with his Lamborghinis talking about his books that he was reading. Ty Lopez, I think, was, was it Ty Lopez? Is that the guy? Anyways, so, you know, you'd kind of like rent the Lamborghinis and take pictures with it and that would be your clout. Well, what a lot of people started doing this last year is buying really high-valued NFTs and posting them they had them. So it's really interesting, um, kind of a, a change in how artwork has been done. We've got a couple of clients now, actually, that um, provide NFTs around songs. So those songs are tied directly to that NFT and minted onto their blockchains. Um, we've seen a lot of different um, use cases uh, from companies that um, uh, non-for-profits that gave out for the donation receipt. They actually got back, uh, you got back for your donation an NFT. Um, so there's, there's a, a huge change that could be happening in the in the future technology built around nfts not not sort of tied to this some of these silly artworks that have been done and kind of applications that have been put out there but really like the use case for receipts memberships uh if you think about like tickets to nfl games which i'm sure matthew has an entire uh entire shoebox at home of all of the tickets that he's gotten eventually he'll be able to just put all the nfts up uh, on a tv screen behind him yeah, so, one of the one of the use cases that came up this year for one of our not for profit clients is um, they 3D print homes for people, and they offered an NFT, which was a picture of the home that you had funded. Uh, it's just like if you if those of you that remember the old days when we were like funding that like I think it's Suzanne was a Suzanne Summers I think of they used to have the thing where you could feed a kid in Africa and then you get their picture on who you fed. Well, the NFT is replacing that um, for 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 that. Uh, so you saw Gene's question. So uh, Gene asked the question, is there any anti-money laundering risk to a client that gets involved with NFTs? You want to take that one or you want me to? We yeah, some I think the updates coming down. So we got some of those planned, but. I Yeah, I think that there's always a risk of money laundering sort of in any, in any business, but NFTs become interesting because the value is determined by what you will pay for that NFT. So for example, um, two, two kind of really big examples that happened last year, if not 2021, um, Beeple, who's a famous digital artist, sold one of his NFTs for $69 million. Uh, it was actually like the, the work over 15 years that he had done. He created this, he had a, a daily artwork that he would create. Um, I, I don't advise you go Google some of those. They're a little bit uh, brash, and, but interesting. None the least, he made these, uh, daily, and he did it every day for, for 12 years, I think. And what he did there is he sold it and somebody provided that value and said, well, that's for $70 million. I think it's the same with artwork. Um, some people tend to buy art to uh, do, you know, they have different tax consequences um, around some of those things. So I think that there, there is a risk, um, but primarily a lot of companies, what they're doing, especially companies, not individuals, is they're buying NFTs um, either for a hold of value, maybe they think it's going to appreciate in value and they can sell it down the road. Um, and the example of, a, of owning a, one of the board apes, as you see on the screen there, is gives you licensing rights. So there is utility to it. As Matthew said, with the Bud Light um, and, and those, those NFTs, it gives you the ability to get swag in the future. I've seen some that were, um, they were it was a, a 3D image of the, an MLB stadium. And whoever won that auction, so it went up for auction, started it at $100 and went up for auction. I think it went to like $25 or $30,000. They were able to tour and they got a VIP tour of that facility. Um, so there's there's intrinsic value related to them. It's not just that they're buying, you know, one that's a, that's a rock for $10 million uh, so that they can take a huge loss on it. Um, I, I'm not sure how those tech consequences work. I don't get to work at techs, fortunately for me. Um, okay. 
we have one more question. Let me get that and then we'll move on to the next one too and sure. do a closing thing. Uh, Dan asks, uh, what's the value of an NFT given as a receipt in that example that we gave with the thing? Well, we actually, hey, hi, Dan, first of all. Uh, we went through a exercise with that one um, and we actually determined that, that, that w- they weren't really buying an NFT and the NFT was just a receipt. So we made an accounting determination that was a receipt and not a, um, they weren't buying the NFT. Uh, so it was just a normal donation for that. Um, but that was a, a great question. I, I will say um, these can get really complicated, um, but there's a couple of types of these uh, that I would say uh, to use kind of really simple analogies. Um, there, there's um, NFTs that are like, you used to have baseball cards. So they just have value to the owner for whatever those value might be like the old baseball cards. Um, there's uh, things like you, you, you see in the in, uh, people trying to use some kind of utility. So they're trying to give you some rights. Uh, so brands trying to give you swag or or some kind of right in the future. And then um, the future state, which people haven't really gotten to, is like it creates a fractional ownership. So it's like your, uh, let's call it a stock certificate for lack of a better example. Uh, any kind of ownership or fractional ownership of, um, say, anything in the real world. Uh, it could be represented by an NFT. So it's supposed to be unique, um, but um, uh, just wanted to give you some of the stuff that happened on there. How about DeFi, Anthony? This is one um, that that, um, that that looks like a lot of the standard financial products we, we've seen, and we see a lot more people using them. So, Yeah, for sure. So what we've seen is a lot of our our customers, if they, let's say they, they did a round of funding and one of their companies paid them in USD coin, as Matthew pointed out earlier, or they were paid in some other cryptocurrency, they can actually stake it. Um, so they can, they can sell it back to, or give it back to um, the exchange or to the blockchain um, that they're working on and they can earn rewards and interest basically. So it, it essentially acts as if it's a certificate of deposit. Um, which is a really interesting uh, financial tool that's kind of built around where you can go pull it back out whenever you want to. So it's not like a CD and that you're locked into a certain amount of time, um, but it does allow them to then, you know, use that to provide um, against loans on the, on, as well. Same thing, same thing that banks are doing, but it's, it's all in built in code, not in people. I think that's one of the interesting things um, kind of around the going to exchanges and, and backwards is, these things, if you're building them on the blockchain, are built into code. So you're you're investing in the theory that the code is going to work. Whereas when when we see, which we have seen, a lot of these exchanges offer interest bearing accounts that are that are a lot higher than we've seen in you know in your ally you know your ally money market account or your your Bank of America checking account. Uh, we've seen the there's there's a lot of fine print, a lot of asterisks to those. Um, I think customers right now in Gemini. Um, that invested in Gemini Earn, they, there's about $900 million that's locked up uh, because the company that was providing that became illiquid. Um, so that's some of the things that uh, that are coming out that are mirrored around traditional finance. I actually talk about it. It's one of it was one of our clients, but actually just a really cool company is called the Splits Protocol. And what they do is they actually <clears throat> you can I can I'll provide a link afterwards. But there's a um, Basically, you can build out this the, the code of it where um, anytime money is received into an address, so anytime money goes in, let's say it's let's say it's for for a, a bet that me and Matthew do, uh, or or whatever, it's a split engagement where I get fifty percent and Matthew gets fifty percent. We actually build it in so that fifty percent goes to me and fifty percent goes to Matthew automatic automatically, right? Automatically, so it's, it goes in there. And the code determines that 50% goes to me and 50% goes to Matthew, either based on our ownership or based on other things. And you can infinitely do it. I've seen a couple of clients where they've done it where the a couple thousand dollars goes in and they get to keep 25% and 75% goes out to um, one of goes out to all of the different artists. So it's all broken down into percentages. So it's those things are automatic. You're not waiting on me to reconcile my books at the end of the month and write Matthew a check and mail it to him in Georgia, it's just going to happen automatically. So that's one of the things that where I see it is going to just really increase. And that's that's DeFi, that's your decentralized finance. And that's how some of those things um, I think are going to really upend the industry in the next 10 years. It's going to upend the regular financial industry as things go on. 
And the, uh, we can probably tee up the next uh, poll question if you want. Um, but um, while you're doing that, um, one of the practical issues that I have, uh, here's the question. So everybody come back. Uh, do you want to hear about accounting or tax for crypto? This is as we get into the regulatory update. Uh, so accounting tax or both. Um, we just want to know where to focus on where the audience is um, most uh, headed uh, so we can um, so we can deal with the next couple of slides. So you have a, a few minutes to do this while while you're doing that. Um, one of the the big things to think about um, as you're getting into crypto and working in crypto with clients is uh, what I found is most of it is a, a translation exercise. So we we know as accountants what what the rules are for cash and and fiat in in crypto world they call that fiat. So we know what those rules are, and half of the battle is is translating what's happening in crypto to what's happening in in cash, and not expecting um, that the cryptocurrency will have um, kind of some magic fix uh, to the risks uh, uh, in the cash world. Um, you know, when you when you you put your cash somewhere, you you deposit it. Uh, you worried about counterparty risk, right? Um, so okay, we got a good mix. Everybody's kind of want, uh, about half and half accounting, and, and about half on both. So that's a uh, well fourth, a fourth and half, if I did my math right. But uh, a good um, for that's an important thing to think about as you're going through this and helping clients. Um, I, I struggled with that earlier in helping folks. Uh, they were trying to put a higher bar on cryptocurrency than they did on their cash recommendations. <laughs> and um, that can be one mistake. And the second mistake is just trusting the cryptocurrency too much for the native crypto folks that they are like, oh, no, this is the best next thing. And not thinking about, like we said, with the exchanges that were bankrupt, what happens if you put your money there and they go bankrupt? What happens talking to them about counterparty risk in a reasonable way to where they don't think we're like, 90 years old and, and, and doing sky is falling stuff. Uh, so we got a regulatory update for everybody. Um, first of all, it's very clear landscape. Um, we've got five, five agencies in the United States, five authorities in the United States uh, that can't agree on one single thing. Uh, the SEC is trying to declare cryptocurrency a security. The IRS has come out and said it's property. Uh, CFCT is called it a commodity. FinCEN calls it a currency. And Gene, to your question earlier, FinCEN has the meanest penalties. So if you get into AML and um, things like that, FinCEN scares me the most. And then the AICPA has been the worst from uh, uh, recently uh, about this. Uh, they initially came out and said that, that this was a intangible asset, uh, which you could only record at cost and you could only impair using the other than temporary impairment rules. And recently, they've uh, indicated that there may be a, a, um, a better accounting for those, um, marking them to market at fair value. So that's, uh, we want to deep dive on the two that matter the most to most of us. Uh, we'll start with the IRS. So the IRS update for the year. So box zero is changing. You saw box zero for those of you that are do tax prep. Uh, hit the returns uh, several years ago where people are just trying to get a sense for who owned cryptocurrency. Um, they are There were a couple of people that have avoided checking that box. So there's an important change to that. Um, this is the new language for box zero. It's basically saying, have you ever touched cryptocurrency in your life? Um, so they're trying, or, well, that's the kind of philosophical way they're headed. Uh, they're trying to get people, anybody that's touched crypto or holding crypto or anything like that, any form of crypto um, will um, needs to check that box. So if you've been avoiding checking that box through some nuance or some uh, perceived um, kind of loophole, but you don't need to do that for your, for your clients, um, this is the year that likely changes. Um, there was a further clarification um, that NFTs, virtual currencies, and the stable coins we talked about, people, some people had interpreted stable coins not as cryptocurrency, that they are all called digital assets. And the language you'll see from the IRS now is digital assets and not cryptocurrencies. So you can see in box zero, the language is changed to digital assets and is a very sweeping definition of digital assets. And, um, and, and, and lastly, um, we're typically seeing most uh, accountants 
um, use uh, a FIFO method uh, or as kind of the safe harbor rule uh, for filing taxes, and it's being filed on the 8949. So that that is um, new. Um, some people will say that's a change. Some people say that's not a change. Uh, but the IRS is getting more aggressive and expecting us to report more transactions on the 8949. So switching gears from the tax side of the house, and we'll have some, um, if you have a tax question, you can start sharing those uh, right now. We'll get to that in the Q&A, hopefully. Uh, we'll try to leave as much time as possible for that. The AICPA has come out. Um, they have, uh, a, like, there is no authoritative guidance on cryptocurrency. Um, there is a practice aid. The practice aid draft still, last I checked, which was a couple of weeks ago, had still referred to the uh, appropriate, appropriate accounting as intangible assets um, and impairing those assets using the other than temporary impairment rules, which I referred to earlier. There is a C change, though, that has happened. Uh, in Q4, uh, the AACPA came out with an indication that um, auditors that are using fair market value or allowing fair market value election is likely appropriate. Uh, if you go back and think of the chart uh, on what cryptocurrency has done over the last 12, 12 months of the year, you could see how accountants would indicate that marking to market is much more representative on the balance sheet of what the value is of that cryptocurrency. Now, if you have NFTs, uh, or anything that is not traded or uh, you can't get a readily kind of a readily uh, expected value for uh, that that's where when we said there's a lot of complexity in nfts um that 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 is um that that's going to be complicated and and helping those are just going to be have to dealt with on a case by case basis but those are two um there are two pretty big changes um the IRS being the one where they're saying just do everything um, and make sure you're, you're, you're checking box zero and following an 8949 and the AICPA moving towards allowing for fair market value uh, presentation uh, in the financial statements. Those are, those are massively important, um, massively impactful, I would say, um, rulings and updates um, that are going to affect us. Uh, hopefully, if you're a tax provider, um, you, you'll see the updates in your tax software shortly for Box Zero, uh, and then we'll talk in a second in the tool overview about some of the tools that are out there helping prep the 8949s. Yeah, Matthew, I think that runs right into one of the questions that we just received, which is, the concept is clear from a tax purpose, but from the practical standpoint, it's very confusing for us and for taxpayers when we need to put a report with 100 raw lines of information into the tax return. Yeah. Yeah, I'm one of the weird people on this one. Um, I, I, I uh, because we we had a clients with hundreds of thousands of transactions uh, that needed to be technically reported on an 8949. And and the analogy that I have that I use with folks saying like when when we had the if you've ever had a client that had that got into day trading stocks and just was insufferable in doing thousands and thousands of trades, I think most of us um, summarize those. <laughs> And you said, okay, uh, various dates through the year. Um, this is the ins, this is the outs, and this is the cap gains and loss. And we just made sure that we got the short-term, long-term correct. Um, so for many of our clients, we are reporting at that level um, with the expectation that um, since 90% of the people aren't reporting and our clients are trying to accommodate that, that that is going to be sufficient um, at least um, to acknowledge that we're making an effort, a good faith effort to do that. We're keeping all the backup um, in zero uh, in our general ledger uh, and some of the other sub ledgers we'll talk about in just a second. Maybe that's a good segue uh, to get us into tools. Uh, you might, um, I think we had three poll questions and, and uh, you might wanna launch that one if you want while we're doing the, the tool intro. I think we had three. All right. This will help us as we go with a tool overview on um, on focusing on some of the solutions because what we found with some of the tech solutions, um, wake up by the way if you are if you're doing something multitasking, 
You got the third poll question. You got to get it in. Got the last one to get the CPE. We got like 48 for 51 right now. So we got we got to keep it up. We got some good records. Um, but just click if you're mostly crypto tax, uh, crypto bookkeeping, both or ne neither. And, and I apologize, I can't spell crypto tax. It's crypto tax uh, over there. So um, but we will still give you CPE if you check that box. Um, but there are five particular tools we've, we've reviewed and there's several that are coming out, uh, but they have much different um, kind of use cases uh, in practice. Uh, we haven't found like a perfect tool for all solutions, just like in, uh, just like why there's uh, multiple tools out there for everything else, bill pay and everything else. Uh, but I want to give you a sense for some of the, some of the options out there that you can use in your practice or your company uh, and what people are doing. Um, the ones on the left are, are, are very well-funded uh, companies, uh, well-funded, at least $20 million raised in the last two years. Um, so tax bit tends to be for large companies. They tend to have a comprehensive tracking solution uh, for cap gains and loss, but uh, the cost to your customer, um, last I checked, was around 20 k a year. Uh, that's uh, mostly, that, that, that does a, that's a pretty comprehensive solution for both tax and um, um, and um, accounting, um, so um, just know that one. There's one called Legible. Uh, this is the one that Thompson Routers invested in. Um, so it's built into TR. Your TR rep uh, will help you with this uh, if you want to add this one. Um, if you're mainly a tax practice, um, there's a, it, it has uh, also has a CCH integration. Um, so they mo most closely aligned with tax prep folks um, and, and producing the 8949s uh, within embedded into those systems. This is the one I'm most familiar with. Um, so they, they it's about a $50 per 10, uh, 8949 cost if you're trying to set expectations on pathing through those costs for uh, your clients. And it allows clients uh, just like a portal to input their cryptos. All of these do. They input their um, credentials for their uh, exchanges and their private wallets, and then it aggregates that data and helps reduce the 8949. Uh, Luca is much um, is kind of more purpose built for hedge funds and traders. So if you're the hedge fund co uh, community, um, you're likely uh, dealing with Luca in some um, form or fashion. Uh, on the right are the two that are the kind of the up and comers. Um, Cryptio uh, it, it is the most similar for if you have a CAS practice. Uh, to replicating the bank feed uh, workflow. Uh, so it's a very similar workflow. It integrates, um, um, and I think both of these tools integrate both in the Intuit products and into Zero products, um, but they act like bank feeds. Uh, and then Bitwave is one. Um, and um, I sometimes just pay attention to who's at the major conferences uh, for which accountants. And Bitwave was at both ZeroCon uh, and, and, and we're going to talk about the other GL that's out there. Uh, they're at their conference too. Um, so, um, so they're very focused on uh, CAS practices uh, that have this problem. And then as you see that, is that a new question that came in or? You're on mute. You're still on mute. But it, it, oh, a... Well, we're answering it in there. Okay. Uh, then we just got one said, what's the approximate cost for crypto and Bitwave? Um, Do you know, you, you're, you're, you've been working, you're like a power user at Cryptio. Um, yeah, Cryptio starts at uh, $200 a month uh, or $299 a month for their um, kind of, it's all transactionally based. So a lot of these, a lot of these tools um, are still trying to, honestly, are still trying to figure out their pricing models. Um, because they're kind of growing and you kind of have to figure out, well, do you, you know, it's like QuickBooks is just in zero or just flat amounts per month, which option you're in. But a lot of these, because they're transactionally based and they have a lot of these things built in, they, um, that they're, they're still kind of tweaking with it. So a lot of them bill you based off of the number of wallets or exchanges and then the number of transactions as well. So a lot of it scales up, but they have some kind of base pricing that they build out. Yeah. And Jonathan says um, Bitwave just hit 15 million Series A, uh, so they're pretty well funded now. Um, and then um, we we do see a price point somewhere between $150 and $250 a month for most of the CAS products. 
Oh, if there was a tool we recommended against, we would leave it off this list, Anne. Um, so if you're asking which tools we don't recommend are the tools that didn't make the list here, there are lots of them. Um, so these are the most stable. Um, a One lot of the of things that I would, I would notate on that point is, um, which direction are you going? Are you going for more of the, the CAS client accounting um, that you're doing for your for your clients? Then like use a subledger that's built for that. Don't use one of these tools that that was built and started for um, for tax tracking for for small amounts of crypto transactions for your individual tax return. Um, a lot of those tools kind of tried to flip really quickly and do the other side of things, and it didn't work out well. Um, Again, as Matthew said, they're on the list. If they're on this list, they're great. If they're not, they're not. Um, but that's just something to think about is really, really think about um, how your tool is going to scale um, with your clients as they grow and just kind of think about what, what implications that has in the future for you. And um, if there's any other questions, we're, we're about to that time. Um, but um, I think Anthony said that well on, on, on the tools. Um, they're, they're coming all coming along really well. Um, um, but, uh, I, we have more recommendations on, you know, definitely pick a tax tool. If you have an individual tax practice, uh, many of your clients will come with you with an often with one of the, the freebie tools or cheapy tools that are out there. Um, and, um, if, if the client has done their work and kind of on top of it, they can, they can generate 8949 from those tools and, and, and give that to you if you're, if you're comfortable with that. Um, that's a solution. I just don't, I don't recommend those as a practice um, kind of being your recommended tool. Um, if that helps um, answer that question um, on which tools to recommend. Um, and I'm not as familiar with the just straight individual tax tools. We do mostly business accounting and in business tax. So uh, if there's an individual tool you like, um, don't take that. Um, like we're not promoting it. I just, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the individual tax stuff. I think we're doing pretty good on time. We're getting our 50 minutes in at least. If there's any other questions, do we have any other polls, any other things that we need to do with? I saw that you posted the, um, oh, we got the zero important stuff. So first of all, thanks to Molly for inviting us. Um, we've been a zero partner um for the um for a long time um about six years um so um i highly recommend if you're not familiar with zero as a tool uh, we have about um 50 of our practice and our cash practice on zero uh 50 on qbo um and it is um one that we're seeing especially if you have a more progressive um uh, entrepreneurs or younger entrepreneurs in their 30s and 40 uh, early 40s they're they're starting to really um, migrate towards zero. Um, so um, check that out and get that info from them. Um, Jonathan has a question. Have you heard of vetted crypto worth? Uh, I have not. Anthony, um, you, yeah. you're, more, you're more familiar with that. You've done that demo, right? I did. And then I actually, last night, actually, I joined their community Slack group. So I've been kind of, they're in my vetting process, if you will. I'm kind of just just hearing about them, just digging into them. Um, but yeah, they just haven't made the list because um, it's not they're not one of the kind of the big ones. But then, um, yeah, we kind of at, at Acuity, what we do is we kind of dig in and see if um, if we know as we use it, as we kind of build it out and see what benefits they provide. A lot of what will end up happening for us is you'll get a you'll get a nuanced client. So a client that's doing NFTs or a client that has an absurd amount of trading volume or or any sort of nuance they're on a a chain that only one one subledger um ends up uh, supporting and so we kind of tend to it, sometimes you have to go with some of those out of the out of the bound setups sometimes um you can go with the ones that you love that are in there but yeah we're, we're vetting them i'm looking through crypto worth to see kind of what they're doing and how things are going to we're trying to, we try to stay as on top of it as possible um we'll probably vet fewer during this busy time at the start of the year, then uh, we will in the downtime in the summer, but uh, we try to stay up on it. There's lots of these out there. Uh, we can't, unfortunately we're one firm, so we can't do them all. 
uh, we can't get to everybody, uh, especially with the ones that are, but those are the two of the ones we use the most are legible and crypto internally. Um, so those are because we don't have any hedge fund clients and we don't have a whole lot of big, big clients for tax bit on, on that. side. What I just heard is Matthew doesn't care if I get crypto sub ledgers on the beach this summer. So that's what will be happening yeah. for me. That's right. That's, that's exactly what I meant by that. Huge thanks to Zero for, for being here. Do we have any other uh, maintenance or other things we got to do? Uh, I don't think so. I think we're good from a polling question and everything. I, I have one question for both of you, and that is, obviously, this is a um, an ever-changing world that, that the two of you are living in in crypto. What, uh, what, what resources have you found to be the best where you can really stay abreast of what's going on in this space? Uh, all right, Anthony, you have anything that, that you that comes to mind? I have a couple. Yeah, Bankless. I follow Bankless's newsletter um, as well as the Morning Brew has a crypto specific newsletter that they put out. Um, I read both of those pretty pretty dominantly, and then I just read anything that comes through on LinkedIn. Pretty much, I, I've got enough people that I follow kind of around the industry that I just it, as articles float through, I go and see them and review them. And then push them out to my team so that they can they can see the same things that I'm reading. Yeah, a lot of the the technologies are leading the way. Um, so legible, uh, Cryptio, and, and those places are great resources um, because what tends to happen in the CAS practice in particular, um, it's a lot about how to use the tool, uh, and then you get kind of some of the ancillary crypto 101 stuff there. Um, you can always follow either one of us on social. Uh, we try to keep people posted. I'm the tech CPA on all the socials. So on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, you do that. Uh, Anthony, what, 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 what's yours? You're AJ, the accountant on, on, is that the right? AJ, the accountant. Yep. AJ, the accountant. Is that just on Twitter or also on LinkedIn? Uh, it's on LinkedIn and Instagram. Okay. Instagram. So see again, the 20 years younger than, than me. So. <laughs> uh, he's technically only 19 years younger than me. So, um, but, uh, it's, uh, not 20. So I like to exaggerate a lot. But, and that's actually, so we, we insightful account, we don't do anything on Instagram. So Anthony, should we be on Instagram? We're not, um, I mean, it's all content is pretty much we produce and, and webinars and events like this. I mean, I think that there's a huge opportunity to post clips and other items. So you can post clips from some of the webinars, put them through on Instagram. I do see a lot of, um, I actually am not during January. So if anybody goes and adds me, I won't respond to it or messages me. I won't respond to it. Me and my wife take a hiatus every January from social media, except LinkedIn, because I kind of have to do it for uh, for business. But uh, I actually find some, so we'll, we'll put it out there, I'll put that caveat, that star there, some good information around um, some of the uh, like the quick reels. And what, what they do for me is I'll see them and I'll note, I'll, I'll, I'll hear something. I'll hear like a comment about some crypto or about the accounting for something. And I'll go, I'm going to dig deeper into that. I'm not going to take their word. Uh, you know, th their word isn't, isn't written in the stone. Uh, so I kind of take it from there and, and then build into it. So that's kind of how I, how I look at some things. And then Acuity has got a really cool Instagram channel. Just have to say, yeah. I love our Acuity Instagram. We do, we do have a blog too, if you'd like, if that's helpful. Um, we do, uh, we have a cryptocurrency page where we try to keep that up. Uh, we're trying to be keep those refreshed, but hopefully that's that's uh, helpful to those of you guys. But reach out to us uh, if you have questions. Jonathan, thanks for saying something nice about us in the comments. Uh, and they're having one of somebody can't see the slides. If we can repost that in the chat. Um, yeah, so that I just grabbed it back in, but you can scroll up on that on the uh, on the chat. You should be able to see if you scroll up. But I also just dropped it back in there as well. So cool. All right. Well, if you two have nothing else to say, I'm sure you have lots to say, but nothing else to say around this topic at this time. We'll go ahead and call it a wrap. So again, uh, Matthew, thank you, Anthony, thank you. Uh, Molly from Zero, thank you so much. We certainly appreciate the support of this and appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to uh, come and learn a little bit about crypto and, uh, and to share a little bit about crypto. Thank you all. Have a Thanks, great everybody. Day. Thanks.